right, Zells, give me the Donny Trump jig because you just saw the Bok. You just saw the Bok 23 and you saw a name at number three. A name that you've been pining for for the last two years. Thank you, Rossi. Thank you. Don't give very much a raster. Cracho Libre is back. Volko Low from the Bulls. My man, the scrum anchor is back in the mix. He's starting for the box this week against England from not even being in the squad to starting the premium game of the tour, mate. A like-for-like replacement. No France Malheur. There is no other Volko Low in the world. There's also no other France Malheur, okay? He can't be out of sight, out of mind. France is in uh, Bredasdorp, resting and chilling, <laughs> getting that nice Overberg. Ah, honest and Seabreeze. Uh, he'll be back. He'll be back later in the year, hopefully for the Stormers or early yes. next year. But Will Colo, so chuffed that he's got his chance. 12 changes to the starting 15 for the box this Saturday against England. The old Twickers called the Allianz Stadium. Scotland thought they'd done so well against the box, and now they have to see that 12 of the starting 15 are different. So maybe they didn't do so well. Yo, isn't that the truth, mate? And they thought they were close. I, I, you know, I said to you, I think uh, maybe some of those refereeing calls where I did actually feel Scotland were hard done by, but I think that was the best thing that happened to them because it gave them a sort of an asterisk on this result where they can sort of hide away in the trenches and think, you know, if the ref had been different, we could have taken those guys. But in the actuality, that experimental Bok team uh, did a fabulous job and came away with a 17-point win against Scotland in Scotland. Uh, no cohesion in that team. It was fabulous. What a okay. win. Okay, well, first you said they were hard done by. There was a clear knock on from you, Jones. So, call back, no try. I don't no know, that was clear, mate. That was pretty clear, mate. That ball went forward out mm, of his hands and onto mad. the turf. Secondly, there was a definite neck roll. They could have injured someone very badly. Try disallowed, mate. So, they went hard done by. They hard done by, man. They went hard done by, man. They got polaxed. First 10 minutes, the box were in charge. Last 10 minutes, the box were in charge. They won that last quarter, 13-3. That was the power. No, the box were in charge, absolutely. And the thing that I can't stand is when, when people say that that wasn't a reflection of the game. The scoreline is not a reflection of the game. No. You play for 80 minutes plus whatever injury time there is, be it two minutes, four minutes. If you score 40 points, when you score them is so irrelevant. Do you score 40 or 30 points and do you win the game? Yes. Then you've done it. Uh, so, Mate, they, they played the most flamboyant fly off in the history of rugby. The most creative, amazing player at 10. They couldn't score a try. We held them to some penalties. We scored four. Four tries. Mapimpi got two, two great ones. Uh, the box conceded 12 penalties, two free kicks. They lost a couple of lineouts. Their kickoff receive was very, very poor, sloppy, inaccurate. We were going to do a review on Monday, or Monday Tuesday when the box team was going to be announced. Yes. Then it was shifted to Thursday. Our thing was also why do a review on a team that's not going to play? We knew there would be wholesale changes in the way Rassi is going to manage his squad, manage his 23 there, yes. and he's 23 today. But we spoke in the week, Zells, about it was an experiment to 23 to manage this team to get what he felt was the preferred match 23. Yeah. All things considered, whoever's fit and available, onto the field against England. Uh, and it was a rip-roaring success in the context of what they achieved. 32-17 at Murrayfield, four tries to nil against a side that kept trialless at the World Cup, a side that's considered by many the best attack inside in the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah, no, I thought it was a fabulous job. I was excited by the experimental selections. I thought they were bold, and to come away with the result despite that, I think is amazing. There's been a lot of studies done on cohesion in sports, team sports specifically, <clears throat> and I think Rossi is really... Um, pushing the envelope on that to get to the bottom of just how much that data actually is valid. Um, and he's finding out some answers around that. I think the box got a lot of answers about who is someone that they should st stick with in the next couple of seasons as they build to the next World Cup and who may be a passenger on that trip uh, in this match. And um, so for that reason, I thought that they, they got answers, they won the game, they were emphatic in that victory, if you ask me. And I think them trying to kind of um, sort of control expectations around this English, England match by saying it was a performance that they shouldn't be proud of and there was a lot to work on afterwards, I think, um, you know, was for PR purposes. I think the box really did, in terms of the context of those selections and the result they got, it was absolutely outstanding. Look, I've been in the box, I've been in, the, in, in uh, Murrayfield stands when the box have won 68-10 under Nick Mallett, Percy Montgomery, just blitz outstanding that day. Yeah. It's the day he also kind of gave James Small his... Uh, 
then record try scoring pass uh, to become the most decorated try scorer in South African rugby history. Uh, I think Monty got 20 plus points. Saw a video of him the other day. I mean, just he was on fire back in the day. Just a wonderful performance. I was also unfortunately there for the lowest performance when we lost 21 6 against Scotland when Rudolf Strolley was the coach. So it is a place that we have traditionally gone there and in the professional era and had to work very hard to beat Scotland. They're tenacious side, they're brave. Uh, it's kind of the story of their, of their history. Brave, but always second. Mm. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Brave, but always second. And I saw Gregor Townsend's comments that uh, they were that close. They were a moment or two away from, from a big upset. He didn't believe... It's, he, he described it as one of Scotland's best games that they've played. No. Now, you play one of your best games in front of a sellout crowd on a Sunday late afternoon, early evening, at home against an experimental box side that hadn't played for six weeks. You concede 32 points, you concede four tries, and you don't score one. It says everything about the quality of the Springbok side. So I was watching it with my good mate Craig Clutie and his wife and Gil and little Pike here running around, and it just seemed like it was never going to end. We were in the lazy chairs <laughs> with a massive screen, and I was looking at Craig and we were looking at each other and just thinking, we're not going to blow this in. We were like 44 minutes. <laughs> so it was a game that just felt like it was just going to go unfair. It wasn't a particularly good game to watch. No. But a very good result for the box. It took us to 22 wins out of 26 in the last two and a bit seasons. That's 84%. Insane. And that's the consistency Rassi Erasmus has been looking for. And in that time, he's won a World Cup, having defended the 2019 World Cup. He has won a rugby championship. And uh, he's been the dominant force. And on average, he's making, in this season, he's making uh, close to nine changes to his match 23 or to his starting 15 every time the box go out there and play. To be able to do that and come away with victories home and away says everything about what they want to achieve this season. No, well, certainly for the players, there's no chance that you can be complacent when you're going into a match with, on average, nine changes per game. So we spoke about it last week about Scotland being like the Wallabies for the Springboks in the sense that they're a team that often perhaps get overlooked on an interview tour because England's on the horizon. And I think that um, by making so many changes, picking an experimental side, you kind of eliminated any risk of that sort of complacency seeping into the team. Everybody would have been right on the tippy, tips of their toes uh, for this one. And like I said to you after the game, I'll give them an A plus for the, the result, probably a C minus for the performance. But even within that, there was some very clever rugby from the box, um, you know, playing what like I call it uh, paratrooper rugby, just the style of rugby that they were playing. Uh, and you look at some of the analytics that came out of that. The boxes are, 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 you know, toying with a few things that I think can make them extremely successful. I mean, they're really extremely successful, but some of those tactics will definitely pay off. So I think they're in a great space. Uh, I think they've, they've kept England guessing in a way in terms of how late, late in the week they've announced this team. They kept us guessing. And uh, when you throw Wilco into the mix, I mean, if you're England, you haven't seen that guy play in the green jersey for a while. So. And you haven't seen him play in the premiership for a while. And he was playing for Harlequins. He was destroying anyone yes. and everyone. And if he hadn't played those 14 tests for, for South Africa, he'd certainly be playing for England against South Africa Correct. on Saturday. Thank God he's in a, a – he's in a, I'm going to say thank God. I mean, thank the good Lord that he's in yes. a green and gold jersey on Saturday. And he's not in that uh, English white with a little red rose. <laughs> He's got a book on his jersey. Yes. Now, we looked at all the comments after the game. I've learned to stay off X uh, <laughs> during a game, to basically stay off it for the weekend, okay? I've learned to even stay off my WhatsApp for a while because it can be, one can look very foolish during 83 minutes of a game in terms of what one puts out there on social Tell media. Tell me about it. But, <laughs> but the passion for the box, I mean, it's just incredible. Yes. Uh, from all over the world, uh, People are tuning in all the time. Uh, there, there is a, you know, we, we, people talk in New Zealand about the way the Orbitz get supported globally. But there is, I've never experienced a fervor around a team like there is with the Springboks and especially South Africans, no matter where they are in the world. And we always do a shout out. On yes, this show let's do a shout out. To locals, to those abroad. But a very special shout out for me today is uh, a family who's very dear to my heart. Uh, Saul Hellman, who owns Chin's Pharmacy and Gardens. He's been my pharmacist for the best part of 25 years. A wonderful man. And he's got three great kids. And the youngest of them is young Max. And he's at St. Joseph's um, out in, uh, out in um, 
Newlands, close to Newlands. Uh, he's in the special needs group there. He's 16 years old. He knows every single country's national anthem. No. He sings it with great vigor. No. <laughs> the one he sings the, with the most vigor, though, is obviously Nkosi Sikileli and the Springbok anthem. But as uh, Saul always says to me, on Fridays before big weekends like this, I think, Saul, it's a bit of trepidation when it comes to November because he knows he's going to hear every anthem sung during the course of November. <laughs> and Max knows every single anthem. So a big shout-out to Max. I know that tomorrow on Saturday night at 20 to 8, that uh, somewhere in the southern suburbs, everyone's going to hear you belting out, God save the kin, <laughs> and then Nkosi Sikileli. And uh, keep on supporting the box. I know you're also a big Stormers fan. And uh, these visuals go everywhere. I know the boys at the box squad do watch. I know Rassi glances at every now and again. And uh, let's see if we can get you a jersey or something to say thanks for everything you do and the support you give the Springbok. So that's the big shout out from within Cape Town Gardens to, uh, to Max Harmon. And then... You picked five again from all over the world? All over the world. Let's start in Moscow where Jay Perry sent us a nice little message. And then there was a hello from Juan Le Casa, Uruguay. I think I went there on a little softball tour when I was a child, you know? <laughs> uh, he says he's a Safa incognito here, yeah, George Pye. Tosca. George Pye, George yeah. Pye, yeah, it's very dodgy there. Eh? Shimmy, is that you? <laughs> Come on. Uh, Tosca Brutus, by a good besprekking. This is. Uh, besprekking. Sorry. Ricky. Eight, Lima, Peru. Uh, Ricky, let's bespreken, let's bespreken. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Uh, Joe from uh, Bandar Seri Begawan, Brunei. <laughs> <laughs> then there's Nikki Flood from Taiwan. <laughs> Nikki Flood, come on, mate, from Taiwan. It's a little bit dodge that. again. Eh? Sure, he wants to know questions about should France have been at the last World Cup. I don't know, mate. Then Hubes, sending much love from Warsaw, Poland. Homesick Cape Tonian, can't wait for the hangover on Monday. And then Sapper Bravo, first try by Sia off a line out of mall. You heard it, Jeff, first, all the way from Fort Benning, Georgia. So those are our shout outs. And I did get a, a, a good one from um, Cryfontein in the northern suburbs of the Western Cape and said, It's not as exotic as an igloo somewhere overseas, somewhere up north where it's cold, but I can tell you how their burivals and their boltons are a lot better. <laughs> and talking of bolton, giveaway time always, prizes. Yes. Uh, Alfie Moss, he won the Salyu City hamper pack. He's from Neisner. And Mariska Marie, the boot and the butcher, she got the bolt on the divorce and the beers. So go to our WhatsApp channel. Again, first try, correct score. Those are the two competitions. Yes. Uh, enter there. We had over 1,000 entries last week. We got that correct score. We also got the correct first try. We just want to know the lotto numbers for this weekend. <laughs> so plenty of prizes to go. Go to the WhatsApp channel. Uh, see what we got to say. Win some things. We got some great prizes. And over the next couple of weeks, there'll be even more prizes as you continue to add to what we can give you on this show. But what we do give you today is absolutely good news that Wilco Lowe is starting at tight end. Glorious. We are chuffed! Can we just have a little shout out to Thomas Tatoya? I thought he had one of his. I want to actually say this now. Thomas Tatoya had one of his better games in the box jersey. I thought the scrumming was outstanding. And then the Giants, Andre the Giant, clearly a big fan of this show, because after I said he probably wants to be Andre the Skillful, that boy came out and just went north south, trucked everybody in front of him, was a powerhouse at twelve. I actually had a, a feeling like he might stick around this weekend. I was kind of looking forward to seeing him play again. So well, he was outstanding. Well, when he said, and again, they hold, they, he was quoted in the media, um, did a lot of media in, in Edinburgh, and he did media again this week. So I thought he'd be in the 20th. I thought he may actually start. Mm. Um, agreed with you. I think it's his best game he's played for the box. Yeah. He was potent. He broke tackles. He ran with conviction. And shout out also to Tommy DeToy, and I thought he would be in the 23 mm. because of his versatility, lucid and tight head. He looked at home, he looked comfortable, he put in a good shift. Um, but it's Vincent Koch, obviously, that they've looked to on the bench. Wilco to start, like we said earlier in the show, a like-for-like -like replacement for France. Yes. And also just giving his form and Harlequins the respect that there is for him within uh, that English setup. But then also, Thomas DeToy playing for Bath and doing particularly well over the last couple of seasons. Yes. Hell of a lot of respect for him as well. Once again, proving just, just the quality of riches that we have in this box setup. If you go back to that Scotland game, Billy LaRue thought he'd be on the bench at least because now he's not going to get to 100 test matches this season. That means it's going to have to be 
in the uh, one of the three test matches against Italy and Georgia, or is it Spain? I think Spain's in Spain's the coming, year, okay, yeah. next June. At least he's going to be guaranteed a win at home when he celebrates <laughs> his 100. So maybe they're doing it as well, where it's to, to get all his family here. Yeah, and yeah, there's yeah. always going to be 100 in, a great call. in South Africa. I just hope the legs are still there by June next year. It's uh, eight months at rugby at that age is a long time. But I thought Vinny looked sharp. Yes. Uh, I thought he kind of added composure when there was a bit of chaos, especially at that time where Scotland had 84% of possession for about 12 minutes. And we were defending like dogs, okay? But with great intensity. But he did bring a bit of calmness to, to that back three, to the kind of setup. Uh, I thought Kane and Moody in the beginning looked a bit undone. Yeah. Uh, he got stronger as the game kind Agreed. of won. But a decision making in the beginning put us under pressure, uh, isolated himself at times when running the ball back. Um, but Pimpy didn't look 34. She's my goodness, He looked mate. 19. Yeah, he was back to his best, on fire. And then... Uh, I thought Lucanio struggled a little bit. Looked a little bit... I don't know if it's the knee or conditioning or a bit of both, but certainly not his sort of sparky, usual self. Massive turnover, though, to swing the momentum our way again. Mm. And that kind of led into that last quarter of absolute control and dominance for the box. Mm. Uh, Andre Pollard, five from six off the tee. Uh, 83%. I mean, that's what you want from your goal kicker. He is the insurance policy for, for Saturday. You're not going to go into any test match up north without a hundred Pollard in your 23, be it starting or on the bench. Correct. When you looked at the pack, you said you weren't overly impressed with uh, the cohesion. You felt it was understandable, but you, you also felt that Ulrich Lowe, Jasper... Yeah, kind expected. of disappeared. So in that third quarter when the bomb squad came on, you expected like this is where they're going to turn it up. It took those guys quite a while to get the generator started and to get them moving. And um, yeah, I just... I thought for a long period of that game, guys like Ulrich and Jasper were pretty anonymous. Um, but then, you know, then the, then the sort of poison started to take its effect and you could see that the box were overwhelming them. I think um, Adkius Neyman is another guy who, you know... Uh, maybe it's like fun and games setting your mates on fire at a bribe, but like in the Bok test setup, you got to kind of like have a bit more respect for the ball. There were times where it was almost like it was flare time because it was a sort of preconceived notion instead of playing the situation a bit more. I'd like to see Adkis Neyman be a bit more mature in his performances. Um, and I think a start this weekend is probably a great opportunity to do that. But if you take, uh, he's got this incredible ability to offload in the tackle. Yeah. It's got a Sunny Ball Williams type ease with which he offloads. Yeah but not necessarily the conviction with which he offloads. So it's now become a fairly predictable thing that the opposition knows as he takes contact, he's going to, he's he's going going to offload. It. That if he doesn't actually offload, you may find him going over someone yeah. and going off on a 30, 40 meter run. I mean, he's got those incredible athletic uh, skills. He looks like a basketballer. That, that, that rugby ball looks like a cricket ball in his hands. Totally. But again, I felt at times, and we, we heard Scott Robinson in an interview a couple of weeks ago saying to his players, You've got to earn the right to, for an offload uh, because it's not just the offload. It's where are you putting your teammate? Are you putting him in, in the coals or are you actually putting him in a better position? Yeah. And I just felt at times when we were looking for a bit more patience against Scotland, looking for just a little bit more calm, it didn't need that forced offload that put a player in a poorer position or the ball went loose and they were scrambling well. I mean, they were playing with such passion and uh, like mm. just going for everything, knowing that they probably had 70 minutes in them. They yeah. certainly didn't have the 80 minutes. So, uh, Especially in a team that lacks cohesion like the box did on, 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 on the weekend because, um, you know, if you're playing within a very tight structure and everybody knows exactly where the ball's going, the forwards are on their way to the next breakdown and everybody knows who the designated cleaner is on every single phase, then it's a lot simpler to kind of play within that and be like, I think it's on now, I know who's coming, he has an offload. But, but there were times in that game where you could see the Bok forwards were guessing where the ball was going and then to sort of throw the variable of an of a offload that doesn't go to hand into that sort of mix, it became a bit of chaos at times. If you looked at a guy like Sia, he's a starter. Um, Definitely. Kwaka, potent if he comes off the bench and he covers so many positions, he can also cover the backs as well. Mm. A guy whose performance I felt was probably indifferent Probably the worst I've seen him play in a box setup uh, was Jaden Hendricks uh, at nine. Extenuating circumstance that we were so poor at the breakdown mm. that he was getting poor ball, or was there a combination of him uh, not always being as like aware? His concentration level seemed to wander. Uh, he was looking up a lot more mm. slow on kind of like the release. Mm. Where 
was it just was it just that he wasn't getting good ball? He wasn't getting good protection. Or did yeah. he had a poor Look, game? I think we got to speculate on that, but you got to think like they, we mentioned the lack of cohesion. The attacking breakdown was pretty messy because of that. And Jaden, by nature, is a guy who I think probably likes to have things a bit more organised than you know Bullock and Roddy. Bullock and Roddy could make order out of any kind of chaos in the streets if he had to. You know, like he's that kind of player. And I think Jaden probably needs a bit more of a platform. I think some of it has to be on Jaden, but I think also a lot of it has got to do with the lack of Keijan. And I think in the second half, when Grant looked a lot better, was when the bomb squad came on and probably playing with a little bit more slickness. So um, I think Grant Williams is also predisposed to be able to handle that breakdown chaos a bit better because he's got the speed to scoot and play from there. So uh, it wasn't one of Jaden's best games, but I don't think it's all on him. And I still think he, he's in pole position in terms of our nine. If you looked at that... Uh collective who would you feel in in the greater context of this squad growth and squad development who would you say kind of put a tick next to their name and who would you say may have put a little question mark next to their name well i mean oxford chair ferocious again bongi the line out and lack of cohesion there people question his throwing ability i think probably some of that has to do with guys just you know getting their combinations together uh, i think thomas detoy had a very good game Irwin was outstanding uh, you know, that guy plays for the badge every time he, he's out there and he was phenomenal. I loved how he just ragdolled uh, that Scottish tight forward. That was great. And they're putting some big hits on him. I mean, there are two massive tackles, well-timed. He got the ball a little bit upright, driven back, but we still won the ball back. So there was great composure in his ability and also maturity. Yes. And even of two, three seasons ago, may have reacted a bit untidily yes. to that kind of hit but there was a respect for the hit and he was back at it again yes. I also love the fact that he quieted Duan van der Maver straight up uh, he was man marking him he like. was I think he ran from Cape Town <laughs> to Edinburgh to get him and he just didn't tackle him he really put him into the grandstand oh, and let and him it, know that he was playing for the wrong team and then the highlight for me was when they did play that short pop pass and Duan was through who was there to grab that jersey? It was really that, that that front visual of him reeling him in. Eh? It was National Geographic, man. It was like a lion jumping on the back of a zebra, mate. It was just Fantastic. like it was like those guys were in the parachute. Oh, players, I loved okay? it. And they're trying to get away. But <laughs> the the velocity is just bringing them back. It was an incredible show of strength. Yeah. And then the tackle as well. Yeah. And then as we thought would unfortunately happen, Duan did start drifting a bit out of the game, and then he wasn't helped with some of the offloads that he got. Uh, some of the passes that he got, which I don't think he was actually that upset about. <laughs> no. You know, I'd rather goes into the stand than he goes into the stand. <laughs> exactly. But, uh, but yeah, Eben was just colossal. Uh, That's for a guy in his 129th test match. Most of anyone's ever played for South Africa to lead the way. I was interested in listening to the, uh, I enjoy listening to Skulk Berger and Victor Matfield, obviously. No one bigger and better than Victor when it comes to the lineouts. Uh, and he was asked about, the inaccuracies, what he felt went wrong. And Victor's big thing there was that he just felt that they were putting themselves, and he knows it's their system, but they put themselves under too much pressure totally. by not being decisive when they get to the line out. And that allows the opposition to niggle, taking to go across. Taking too long to get there. Taking yeah. too long to get there. And he says, the moment you miss one, mm. there's doubt in your mind. Mm. There's confidence in the opposition. Mm. And he spoke about his day, but then I also thought uh, there wasn't anyone really like you. He would just walk into the line out, call it, take it, and that was their ball. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Not even the totally. box ball yards. So. But I mean, Victor didn't play in teams that had this kind of like uh, personnel rotation, you know. So you had a whole bunch of new players. You can see they're still experimenting with Tony Ball. That short lineouts is still on the menu for them. They're playing around with that sort of thing. And uh, the delivery of those lineouts, whether they maul it, whether it's off the top, whether it's down and out. They were playing with all sorts of stuff there. So there's so many moving parts to the box now. Lack of cohesion is definitely going to be one of the downsides, the symptoms of that. And I think um, the fact that we keep our set piece together as well as we do is phenomenal. 83% of the lineout is low for, for box standards, but given all those changes, that's still pretty damn impressive. Yeah, I mean, to, be, to, to do that and basically win, win uh, lose only two test matches so far this year and both test matches by a point, mm. uh, and be able to make nine changes to your starting lineup every Jeez. time, uh, and keep that 23, probably 14 out of that 23 together, uh, to do that when there's breaks in between home and away against the best teams in the world, I mean, there's a credit to that. I also enjoyed uh, the interview I, I read with uh, Tony Brown did, 
and I think he was speaking to you. What did he say? He said, Zolz, I will never <laughs> interfere with the DNA of South African rugby. Oh, man. I don't want the Springboks to play like the All Blacks. Oh. He said, I want the Springboks to be direct. I want them to be physical. Uh, I want them to take contact when they can. Shortest way to the, li- uh, to the try line is over someone. He said, but what we're trying to add to their game is a variation, uh, is something secondary in terms of the way they attack, getting the big guys in the wider channels. And he said that was the message that Rossi gave him. How do we get our special athletes? into positions where they can actually dominate the tackle. Yes. So I thought that message was directed right at you oh, to say, mate. don't worry, we're not going to become the All Blacks. We <laughs> will always see. be the Springboks. And when he went on the breakdown, I even love that he spoke about we as the Springboks. Oh, what we well are done. doing, mate, is in South I Africa, we are doing those things. So that was encouraging yeah. uh, to, to kind of read as well. Uh, a good win, and I think people shouldn't have got too down on the win. Uh, it was also kind of expected after five weeks that it would be a bit sloppy. And I think that's the standards we now get into, that we are, as Rashi said, was not a particularly uh, performance I'll be particularly proud of in terms of a rugby context, very proud of in terms of a result context. Very much okay. so. I mean, before the game, if you told everybody about those changes and then said 32-15, people would be like, that's pretty good. It's the performance that people, it's got people jarred. Okay, so you know that I chat to a lot of people, obviously, as yes, you, you do. do. Yes, you do. And, uh, and Mike Sharma from... Uh, Retroviral, Retroviral yeah. probably the best creative in this country, uh, without a doubt. Some of the ad campaigns he does, outstanding, so closely linked to sport as well, and all sorts of social uh, corporate responsibility programs. Uh, and he's a big, big fan of the box, big fan of the Proteas, big fan of Bafana, uh, the Proteas uh, 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 netball squad, the hockey, you name it, Olympics, Team South Africa, he's there it's with campaigns. No, he's all over it, okay? And uh, we were chatting about the box and... Uh, and the box scrum and all that kind of stuff. And then he said to me, hey, I've got, I've got this, uh, this great client. Um, they are uh, Stecker. Uh, and I said, yeah, what do they do? He said, look it up. And he said, uh, Ryobi, the same Ryobi, powered by Stecker. It's power tools. It's generators. It's like the box pack, he said to me. <laughs> and uh, let me see if they may be interested in being on your guys' show and all that kind of stuff. And how do we do it where it's not contrived, et cetera, et cetera. I said, give away a lot of generators. Okay? <laughs> give away a lot of prizes. Right. Oaks love that kind of crap. Okay? They, just want, they just want things. Okay? Yes. Uh, if there's prizes and it's quality prizes like that, yes. uh, we can do anything you want. Okay. Yes. Uh, but just pay us a lot of money, mate. <laughs> it's all about the money. <laughs> he but said, we can't do that at the moment. But what we can do is kind of uh, give exposure to the brand because they're also... They're also a client of his that does so much for rugby upliftment with teams, with oh, people, brilliant. and it's changing lives, okay? And we'll get into that over the next couple of weeks, and we'll tell some of those stories of the lives they've changed and what they're doing with rugby academies and sporting academies. But his big thing was, let's introduce a section, eh? Yeah. The power play of the week. Because they're all about shaping the future. They're all about power tools that won't quit, etc. Let's do power play of the week. So I said to him, okay, we're going to do three games. We're going to do Ireland against uh, the All Blacks. We're going to do Australia against England and we're going to do the box against Scotland. We'll have a few nominations, what we thought were power players, and then we'll have a winner. Sure. And the winner will be the Ryobi Stecco Power Play of the Week. Oh, I like that. So, I like that, let's mate. start off with Dublin. Now, I got a lot, a lot of messages, obviously. People being mm. very clever after the fact. Someone saying to me, how did you ever back Ireland to beat the All Blacks in Dublin. <laughs> and my answer was, they hadn't lost there for four years, 19 <clears throat> test matches, and they'd pumped them for the last two times in Dublin, and the All Blacks hadn't won there for eight years, and I felt Ireland were the better team <laughs> playing at home. Yeah. Clearly, I got it wrong. <laughs> Mate, you got it wrong. I, I think I called it by 16 points. <laughs> I had Ireland to win 30, what is it, 30 18. Oh, I don't eh? remember, mate. I blanked it out of my mind. 30 18. Yeah. What I didn't factor in was a Friday night in Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> and those Irish guys would like to be at the hotel or be in the pub, not yes, in a rugby field, yes. okay? I also didn't factor in that they hadn't played since July they in South cold. Africa. And uh, I also didn't factor in that New Zealand had played a big test match the week beforehand. Yes. So back of the queue to me, uh, a lot mate. of those messages you guys sent me, voice notes you sent me, I've never listened to, okay? <laughs> I didn't have to. Keep I knew what real. was coming, okay? I knew it was coming. So... Uh, Big moments for you in that game? Uh, it was an untidy game. I don't think either team will be particularly happy with their performances. Obviously, All Blacks very happy to clinch the win there. Ireland will be shaking their heads. Uh, Did you watch it? Yeah. 
I think the highlight in that game was probably that uh, ridiculous long freaking 50-22 from James Lowe. That was a great moment in that. Uh, okay, now James Lowe, the New Zealand Maori uh, winner who went to Ireland as part of the overseas projects and has been one of their star players and has been very, very boisterous and vociferous every time they've been in New Zealand, which has been five out of ten times. Uh, and it's only five times in the history that they've won out of New Zealand's won 32, and I think there's been the odd draw. He was a little bit quieter uh, at the World Cup, and he's a little bit quieter in Dublin. Uh, but he took a big ribbing for his reaction at 23-13, 71st minute, to get so pumped, scream at the crowd and that. And I think he was spot on because they needed a lift. Totally. New Zealand were dominant. I thought it was a poor, poor grubber through from Will Jordan. Why did he have to kick the ball, keep it? They were very strong, uh, controlling that game at that stage. Their bench had, had proved more powerful than, than Ireland's. And... That team needed a moment, a power moment. Absolutely. Uh, right. And especially from someone who doesn't quit. And that's, that's that bloke, that's James, James Lowe. Lowe. And I just thought it was bloody good defense from New Zealand for two minutes to keep them out. Ireland score there. It's 23-20 with five to go. It could be a very different result because uh, we've seen how New Zealand has fallen away in tight yes. games. So I think for me, that was a power moment from yeah. that test match. Totally. Uh, a moment I'll remember for all the right reasons. Great bit of individual brilliance from uh, James Lowe, but the right result that the All Blacks won. It. And also, let's just digress for a second there. If there's anything Gregor Townsend needs to do in Scottish rugby, is to get the Scottish people to open their mouths. That stadium was like a morgue. I think if the Scotland fans had actually got behind them a bit more, you might have seen more out of that Scottish team. So I, hats off to James Lowe to try to get the crowd into the game and to, to pump up the team. I thought that was fabulous. And that kick was outstanding. I don't know how much of it he intended, but it was a great Look, nudge. he's got a great left boot. Yeah. Uh, to me, he's one of the best winners in the world because of his all-round game. And credit to Ireland, they really developed his game, they co developed his conditioning, and kind of turned him into a test player when he was always on the peripheral in New Zealand. New Zealand Maori player, played for the Chiefs, but was never quite in the all-black equation. And as Ian Foster said at the time, him and, and, and um, Jameson... Gibson Park. Gibson Park. I was going to say Park Gibson, that was all right. <laughs> Gibson Park. They went to Ireland and have become better players. Yeah. I, and and yeah. that you've got to give the Irish system for developing them. Yeah, I think, I think James Lowe is definitely on the shortlist for Ireland Rugby's award for best foreigner of the year. So okay, yeah. I think he might win it. I don't know. That nine's not too bad. He's not too bad. And that... Uh, Mackie Hansen. Yeah, he's back in the mix as well. Mm. And Bundiaki. Well, Bundy. he's there and thereabouts. I see he's not playing this yeah, weekend. Yeah. Um, but he also, I mean, I thought they... They tied him up nicely. The only time he looked effective was when uh, Geordie Barrett was not on the field. <laughs> yeah. And then he was running against no 12. His, his opposite number was sitting, uh, counting down the 10 minutes for that yellow card. A yellow card that I also didn't believe was a yellow card. But uh, we won't go there. We'll be here all day if we're talking about what should and shouldn't <laughs> have been not? yellow cards. We look at that match at uh, Allianz Twickenham. Once again, I got a lot of messages saying, how could you call an England win? Very easy. <laughs> very, very easily. <laughs> Very easily, that could have been an England one. No, but how could you call it pre the game? Well, Australia had won one out of six in the rugby totally. championship. Uh, they, and that one was a last minute win against Argentina. They took 60 points uh, in Argentina. They got smashed by the box in two successive weekends. New Zealand clobbered them. Uh, I thought they'd get blown away by 15 points at least. And the I way that 16. game started, totally. I thought, yeah, we're in, we're in for, a, for a big one here. But an incredible game of rugby, eh? Incredible, and I mean, if you'd said to England you're going to score 37 points against England and uh, against Australia and lose, I mean, who would have believed that at Twickenham? Insane. I think the highlights of that whole thing, aside from the thrilling, uh, you know, to and fro at the end, there was just uh, new kid on the block, Joe Suwali, mate. What a talent! And I mean, what are we doing in rugby that a guy can just come from another code and basically just blow up everything you know about the game and how it works and what can be done? Just some of those touches, insane. Well, he was a great schoolboy union player, uh, went to league, signed for the Roosters, ages 19 to 21, uh, probably had two weeks of training, has never played a senior rugby union game. This is my point. Goes in and plays 13 at Twickenham against England, an Australian side that's struggling, and just does some magical thing. Now, he's aerial skills. Well, that's what I was going to say, Matt. What are we doing in strength of conditioning in rugby union that a guy can come from league and his vertical leap alone, he can out-jump a lock. I mean, Murray Toja in the kick receipt was being lifted and he got out-jumped by Joe. That would definitely be one of my power plays. 
So, I mean, he, he was outstanding. I mean, there's a couple of clips going around his contribution to the game, but just his poise and his calm. He uh, comes from good stock. His father played for Samoa in, uh, in rugby union in the World Cup, I think 2007. Mm. He did play a uh, rugby league World Cup for Samoa as well. But, you know, the NRL, Roosters, it's, it's a hell of a tough league. Uh, it's a great schooling, great grounding for those young rugby league players. But there's an excitement about him that we haven't, kind of experience since Sonny Bo Williams came over and Izzy Falau came over and in the earlier days Jason Robinson you know and I saw Clive Woodard had put out a, a, a column before the test match to say I think this guy's going to be more Jason Robinson than Sam Burgess oh, wow. that means he's going to be a success Wow! so he was very good we talk about the Sonny Bo Williams I'm talking about the Lenny <laughs> Lenny Ikital the Lenny Ikital offload right to Max Jorgensen over try time game set a match now, here's the interesting stat. Jorgensen, on his debut, off the bench, on the win, scores as 20-year-old. His old man, <laughs> Peter Jorgensen, 1992, off the bench against Scotland, 20 years old, on the win, plays his only two tests for Australia, a couple of years later, goes to rugby league for six or seven years, comes back to Union, plays in England, plays for Northampton, among other teams, finishes off with Edinburgh. He's only 51. His kid's 20. What a father-son story. Wow. That is incredible. What a good history lesson I just wow, gave you. Wow, that's amazing, man. So, I mean, if you're, a, if you're a punter out there, mate, and Max has got a little boy, wait 20 years and put some money <laughs> down. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be the third one yeah. to play. Uh, what all Max has got to do now, though, is go back to league, or go to league, right. and play for the Kangaroos, because his old man didn't do that. <laughs> okay. okay, to get one over the right. old man. We are talking power plays. We're talking the Ryobi Steco power plays, courtesy of Retroviral and Mike Charman, my mate, who said, hey, guys, we could have someone who could align with your show. Do it. Uh, tools that don't quit, you know doesn't quit. The Bok Pack. Yo. So for all the sloppiness, I think there was one scrum that we didn't get the penalty. I think we just want to take a breather. But they got their, they got their first put in on around 34 minutes. Scrum penalty meanly. Every time, every time that Bok Pack went down, that arm went up, you just knew... Power play. And we couldn't take the second. Uh, we, even when we got the free kick, we couldn't take the scrum again from that. So the talk that our pack would be depowered through the rule changes, no. No, not at all. I mean, that, that box scrum is uh, like a pneumatic drill, mate. It just goes. I mean, those oaks, every time we pack down, it's going to be a penalty or a positive result for us. Uh, it gives us, like we've spoken about countless times, field position, puts us in uh, set-piece territory. It's fantastic. Uh, you can't give Oxen Chair, Bongi, and on, on the weekend, Tom DeToy enough credit for the work that they get through. Uh, incredible. I'll, I'll scrum. So, set piece, fantastic. The big highlight when they did scrum was that. That was the one area that we just knew we were strong. Uh, but that foundation also led to what we both agreed post the match when we chatted was one of our moments of the game, and it went to one of the veterans, and that was the try created. Great work done up front. Great patience in the build-up. 32nd minute of the test match. Who gets it in at first receiver? Vili the through Vili LaRue. Beautiful vision. Cross kick to Mapimpi, who's not even in the frame at that stage. That's how well Vili and Mapimpi, it was telepathic the way wow. they read it. Try time. Mate, that's one of the most exciting tries, Springbok tries for me for a number of reasons. If you watch the, the, the phase sort of build-up to that, the box are sweeping right. Vili spots at the Scotland defence is now sweeping right to cover. He sees the open space on the left. Uh, the Bok forwards are coming around the ruck. He runs through them, almost runs into Sos. Uh, he spotted that Makazoli is already on his way to the left wing. Calls for the ball, gets it at first receiver. And then as that England line comes up, he just lofts that ball into the space. Basically hangs it up like a basketball layup for Makazoli to get to for the try. It was absolutely superb, individual brilliance from Vili. And if you're a rugby coach and you watch that, and that doesn't unlock your brain about where the opportunities are on the field in terms of space and the ways to get there, the ways to use the kicking game. I mean, it's, it was a massively exciting try for me. I thought it was brilliant, brilliant vision and a great finish by Makazoli. They're both on the same page, telepathic. So out of all of that, would you agree that the Ryobi Steco power no play doubt, of the week? Mate. No doubt, No doubt. Makazoli, Mapimpi. 
Hundred percent, and he is the winner that won't quit. I mean, he's a power tool. I mean, he's thirty four and still going strong. Does he look good? Eh? I really enjoyed his. I really enjoyed his performance. It was wonderful for him to go back to Murrayfield, get two tries where he got there a couple of years ago, and that's the one thing I've also loved away about the way Rusty's managed these older players. Eh? He hasn't put anyone out to pasture. Mm. There was a moment where Mapimpi was struggling with a bit of form. Uh, he didn't pick him. They kept him in the mix. He went back to the URC uh, Challenge Cup, played well there, and it's given him opportunities. And wow. Yeah. He's looked good, eh? Yeah. Uh, he's not there, though, this weekend. Neither is Kane and Moody. Neither is Vinnie LaRue. Now, that starts... Neither is Andre Esterhazy. Ooh. Lucky Am is there. He's on the bench. On the bench. He's not starting. Neither is Andre Pollard as a starter. And neither is Hendrickson. They've changed the whole back line. Correct. Seven changes to the back line. Twelve in total. Different back three. Different lock starter. And tight head prop, obviously, will cut in. 12 changes out of that 15. And that 15 was pretty darn strong. It was incredible, mate. Um, and to bring back the quality of talent that you bring back now, having seen what we just did to Scotland, you've got to be quaking in your boots if you are in the England lineup. But also, you can't really take anything in terms of analysis if you're England from that Scotland test match. No. And I think that's what Rossi wanted. He wanted them not to have anything outside of potentially what they had from the 16-15 uh, yeah. World Cup semi-final defeat uh, in Paris, where for all money it looked like the box were gone for 75 minutes. Totally. Uh, Especially if you look at the 9-10-15. I mean, it's a completely new combination. How much do you really know about Fassi other than that he's deadly on the counter-attack? Uh, you know, you just look at the speed of Grant Williams, Le Box, uh, flair and creative ability. He's going to freestyle and catch you with all kinds of kicks. Doesn't even have to look at where he's kicking the ball. That brings the wingers in who already, their reputation precedes them. And in that power pack with Dukes in the middle of the field just going forward every time he touches the ball and Jesse locking everything down from 13. That's a challenge. Did you, were you surprised that he's gone Williams and Lebok and, and then with uh, Reinoch and, and Pollard, the senior veterans, to potentially come close the game out or to come on in the last 20 or 15 regardless of, of how it's playing? Yeah, I think or, conventionally you think it's going to be like the sort of uh, stoic guys to start building innings and then you bring on the Mavericks to come and light it up and have a go. But it's kind of inverted because you've got the speed and creativity starting and then the experience there almost as insurance on the bench. Well, isn't that thing that you, you lose a test in the last 20, you don't, you don't win it in the first 20 necessarily. Yes. So there is that freedom for Marnie Leboc as he played. Uh, in the in the win against Argentina mm. in Alsprate to go out there, play his natural game. Cheslin Colby will probably do the kicking to start off with. It may be that they don't kick for poles if they don't have to, unless it's a sitter, a gimme. They play like they did against New Zealand, kick to the corners, bring their pack into play. Because the one area that I felt all season, tell me if I'm not seeing the right games, is I don't think our lineup mall has been as effective as I've seen it two, three years ago. No, spot on. And I think that's because we've been experimenting with different line-out line uh, line setups and what we do off those line-outs. So we're probably not getting the same reps and the same focus on the drive that we used to have. Uh, the, potentially, we reap the fruit of it this weekend because England isn't really sure how to defend it. You know, uh, do they contest? Do they try and stop the mall? What are they going to do here? So it kind of does keep them guessing and hopefully we'll see some of that this weekend. Okay, so England had a chance to beat the All Blacks. George Ford missed a penalty with two minutes to go, and he missed a drop goal from right in front with the last play of the game. Jamie George, chariots of fire. Still see that eyes as the ball drifts past. <laughs> they thought they'd won it with two minutes to go against Australia. They lose it in the last minute. So they're looking at two defeats. That could, the margins are so narrow and small that it could easily have been two wins. But we can't be lulled into a false sense of, because Australia beat them, we're going to smash them because... Outside of the odd big win at Twickenham, we've taken, we've had some pain there. I think, what did you say? It's 12 out of 24 that we've won and the 12 we've lost. 11 we've lost, one we've drawn. Historically. Uh, when I look at Rassi's and Jacques Nienhaber's excursions there, it was that infamous 12-11 defeat, uh, the Owen Farrell tackle on yes. Andre Esteres, yep. the last player of the game. And then the 27-26 defeat, uh, giving away a penalty. we just taken the lead. Uh, Marcus Smith bans it over, and they beat us. And that was the world champion side they had beaten, okay? We then did beat them well in the last one, where Marnie Leboc and Damon combined brilliantly to kind of close out that game. But there does seem to be a psychological effect when the Springboks play at Twickenham 
that seems to give England 10 points that they don't have anywhere else when they play us. But usually when we play those guys, we haven't done what we did in Scotland with an experimental team, massive changes for this one. Uh, and we've never gone to play England at Twickenham as back-to-back -back World Cup champions. So I'm going to say the box are going to pump England this weekend. I'm when you confident. say when you say pump them, will you qualify that by points? So 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 I th I think it's going to be a relatively high scoring game. Uh, South Africa are five and three against England under R Russi's tenure, I think, and um, the bookies have got us as seven point five favourites. I think the box are going to win this one by twelve points. I'm going to say South Africa thirty two, England twenty. It's interesting to say that because I had a twenty eight sixteen uh, scoreline. You know why I went for twenty eight sixteen? I was watching one of the games uh, from, from a couple of years ago on the telly, and there was a great Bok movement, and I turned up and it said 28-16 in terms of time on the clock. And something said to me, <laughs> that's going to be the score on Saturday. 28-16. So go to eBets as well. It's your... science. <laughs> it's science, man. I was just glancing up. I thought, 28-16. Got to be. Box by 12, not box by 10. That's, that's you my know, 25-15 on Saturday. I sat back in that lazy chair at Craig's house <laughs> and 70, 70, 77 and a half minutes, 25, 15, and I thought, box by 10. Never in doubt. Although I didn't know the minute they got that penalty, it was going to be box by more than 10, okay? But uh, I do have the box to win. I think it's going to be tough. No test match against the top eight, nine teams is ever, ever easy. They're going to have to work hard to do it. I'm expecting a far more disciplined performance from the box, more cohesive. This, this kind of team that's playing is far more settled. They've played a lot more together. Got the most, most capped midfield in the history of Springbok rugby in uh, Dialandi and Creel. You've got a back three that is on fire. You've got halfbacks that are hell of exciting. You've got a season pair of campaigners who can come on if something doesn't go right there. And I do think they've got the, the, the balance of the starting pack right, eh? where uh, Archie step up in the, in, the, in the absence of injured um, of uh, Mostert. Eben, wow, him and Atoji. That's just worth the entrance fee alone, okay? Um, looking forward to that one. Looking forward to Ox just smashing them on the loose end. And with the greatest respect to, to Thomas the Toy on the tight end, there's only one Wilkolo when it comes to scrumming. So to have Ox and Chair on the loose end, Bongi at hooker, tight end, Wilkolo, mm. and then even Esteban and Achilles Neyman locking in behind them with a Peter Steff de Toy, <laughs> Jasper Visser and Asir Khaleesi. I mean, that is a brute of a set-piece pack. Yeah, I think we're going to have a great game from Erkis name on this weekend. I also think we need to like, look at the context of this England team. Like, I think uh, all the stuff off the field, Danny Kerr, Danny Cipriani, you know, all the stuff that's going around Eddie, uh, Joe Marler retiring because he sent out a silly tweet. I think the, the sort of um, reputation of this England team is unraveling a little bit. And I'm just wondering whether these guys actually have the mental fortitude for this stuff. I mean, if you look on the weekend when Marcus Smith kicks the kick to put England into the lead right at the dead there, Jamie George is having a bit of a giggle on the touchline. Uh, I just don't know whether these guys have got, have got their heads in the right place and I'm not sure whether they actually are made of the right stuff. And I think the box are going to drive that point home this weekend. Well, I hope so, because if they drive that thing home, they'll win comfortably. And I... Given the form of Wales, it doesn't really matter who we put out. <laughs> uh, if it's 23 guys from this squad dressed in green and gold, they'll be good enough to they'll win in okay. Cardiff. Yeah. Wales losing 24-9 into Fiji. Great win for Fiji. Very much Great so. win for Mick Byrne, uh, who back in the day was, uh, was one of the kicking consultants with the Springboks. We're talking under the Harry Falloon era. Lovely bloke. Hugely successful with the All Blacks. Went back to the Wallabies. Did Fiji Drua, and now with the Fijian side. It was very tough for him. Tenth successive defeat for Wales. Uh, Warren Gatland, a hero there, has come back. He's working with very little. Ten on the trot. Uh, Steve Hansen also lost ten on the trot. Then went to New Zealand and won 90% of his tests over <laughs> five years. Which tells you it's not always about the coach. It's about the quality of the 100%. cattle. 100%. The quality of the cattle. Make so, your pick. Make your pick. So my pick for what? For Australia, Wales, mate. Australia, Wales. I know Australia's definitely going to win, mate. What's the score? They got Lenny and Joseph <laughs> Lenny and Joe. <laughs> okay. And they got Campo who, who gave them a history lesson. Mm -hmm. Told them who Greg Cornelison is. Now Scored four tries against the All Blacks, now mate. They know. So there's a pride in the gold jersey. I've got Australia to win that 30 20 by 10 points. Okay. I've got Australia 34 27, made a seven point win. All right. Then what other games do we have? We've oh, there's a couple of big ones. Ireland-Argentina. <laughs> Ireland-Argentina, Friday night in Dublin. 
interesting stat you told me? Uh, Argentina have never ever won in Dublin against Ireland. And uh, that's not going to change. But they've played them four <laughs> times in World Cups, mate. Beating them three times, clearly the World Cup is the kryptonite for the Irish. So let's see if Argentina can finally break that duck. I don't think they will, but it would be great if it was another Southern Hemisphere sweep, mate. No, it would be wonderful if, uh, if Ireland could lose back-to-back test matches. It would be great that if at the end of this month they might rank fourth in the world. I'm actually worried about <laughs> them, mate. I'm really, really worried about Irish rugby because... Now that Super Rugby Pacific has dipped like that, where are they going to get their players from? How are they going to pull out of this? Look, they were, they were very poor against the determined All Black side. If, what we keep on saying, an All Black side very much in transition, okay? But Argentina, 50 points to 18 against Italy. That's a big win away from home. Very much so. Uh, Argentina have beaten France at home. One out of two tests. They've beaten the box at home. They've put 60 plus points past Australia at home. And they scored the most points in the history of a test match against the All Blacks in New Zealand to win in Wellington earlier this year. They're a team who can play and can win. Mentally, do they believe they can beat Ireland in Dublin? And that's going to be the key for me. They certainly got the squad to beat them. It's Do they have the six inches yeah. to beat them? Yeah, yeah. And I don't think they do. I think Ireland bounces back. Ireland wins 30-18, yeah. 12 points. I got them 24-16. A little bit closer, but Ireland to win. And then... The one that comes after our big one on mm. Saturday night, if you can stay up for it, it's France against the All Blacks. Uh, no one would have given the All Blacks, least of, for me, I thought they'd be down two test matches against England and against Ireland. They're three from three on tour. We know they should beat Italy, which make them four from four. This is their big one. Uh, they've lost 14 times out of 63 to France. Historically, they've dominated them. However... Comfortably beaten in the last two times they've played them. Comfortably beaten by them in the pool stages of the World Cup. But only 12 of that French 23 who play them at the World Cup remain and less than 12 of that All Black 23. So to quote a lot of blokes, it's a different <laughs> year, mate. It's a different game. No relevance. Yes. Who have you got going there? All right, mate. I'm not going to make the same mistake I made last week. I say the All Blacks are back in black and I'm going to have them beat Le Bleu. This weekend. 30-26. 30-26. So. You've got the All Blacks to win. Yep. I don't think the All Blacks are capable of scoring 30 points against France at the moment. I've got them to equal their best ever three in a row. I've got them to win 28-22, knowing that New Zealand will probably have two players in the bin throughout the <laughs> game as well. Yeah. So go to Ebets, uh, win some money. Monty won some money last week. So did my son, Ollie. Monty, the Bach legend, sent me a message saying, all blacks, yes or no? And I said, never in a hundred years. <laughs> Ollie sent me, yes or no? I said, never in a hundred years. They both said, well, we're picking them. <laughs> so <laughs> and they made some money. So they put some money down yeah. and they won on it. So they get, they'll be my pundits for this weekend. Um, Monty did send me a message. He's a little bit nervous about England, but I think he's always nervous about those kind of games. Uh, he did also say... It's a gut feeling. He did have a curry last night. I said it is the curry, <laughs> uh, It's definitely the curry. We're too good to lose against England if we play well. It's a great weekend again, Zells of Rugger. Blockbuster rugby, mate. We will be back on Monday, regardless of when the Bok team's been announced. And we're going to give you a wonderful review uh, on a Bok team that is officially ranked number one in the world. Back-to-back World Cup champions. Rugby championship title winners in 2024 and British and Irish Lions winners in 2021. Tune in to them. What time is that game? Uh, that game is a 7.40 kickoff on Saturday. 7.40 kickoff. After that, it's the All Blacks against France. Those are two really cool games. If you have the energy, Friday night, Argentina against really Ireland in Dublin. Uh, give that one a miss and watch the highlights package, okay? <laughs> and... Uh, I'd also say give the Wales... 6 p.m. on Sunday. Yeah, give Wales and... Uh, I mean, you've got to have better things to do on Sunday. <laughs> 6 PM. Give Wales and Australia miss as well. Watch the highlights package. Uh, it will take a lot for us to watch that full game, but we will speak with great authority next Monday <laughs> like we have. And uh, don't forget about Portugal. They'll be up against Scotland.